Uh, so thanks very much. Uh, so I, I'd like to talk about uh, a new invariant of smooth projective varieties that's defined in terms of elliptic vibrations over those varieties. Uh, so just to give an example, maybe the first non-trivial example of an elliptic vibration is take a pair of even curves. P2. Uh, so F equals zero. G equals zero. Uh, so I'm working over C, but as usual, I'll draw the pictures over R uh, for because of this row constraints. And I want to look at linear interpolations between these two cubics. So this is called a pencil of cubics. So for any S and T. In CP1, uh, there's a cubic, which is some, something in between this F and this G. Um, and so for a generic point in, in P2, uh, there's only, it only lies on one of these cubics from the pencil. Uh, so there's a, you can find a, a rational map from P2 to P1 that just sends a point out here to the, to the S and T corresponding to the cubic curve on which it lies. But this map is not obviously not defined everywhere because there are these nine base points. So the intersection points of the two initial cubics are going to lie on every cubic in the pencil. And so to, to resolve this, this rational map to a regular map, you need to blow up those points. Um, so to so blow up a P2 at these nine points uh, actually gives you a regular map to P1. And this is an elliptic vibration. So this R, R, I'll call it R, it's, it's a rational surface, and it's fibered over P1 by the curves. Just to draw that a little bit differently, if this is R, and this is P1, uh, there's a vibration here where the fibers are the, the cubic curves uh, in P2 that we're looking at earlier. And so, so another thing is that there's you can mark these base, let me mark these base points in colors. So if I mark the base points in yellow, these turn into sections of the elliptic vibration uh, when you're when they're viewed this way, because uh, the exceptional divisors for the blow-up each map isomorphically onto P1, essentially because the, the, the cubic curves can sweep out the entire tangent space into those base points. And I'm calling it an elliptic vibration because I'm going to distinguish a particular section that I'll mark in red. So just choose one of your base points arbitrarily and call that the zero section. So this is the zero section, which gives me a good flaw uh, on my elliptic. Okay, and so, so for a general for a general section, so given section separation sigma. Defines its height to be just the number of times it meets the origin. So the number of times it uh, intersects the zero section, Z. Okay, so a good, a good exercise to kind of see what's going on here, why it's interesting is, is to ask how many sections are there. Zero. Okay, so there, there's clearly going to be at least eight. So we have height zero means that you're just joined from the zero section. So these these yellow points over here, which correspond to the yellow sections over there, obviously don't meet the zero section. So you have eight, the eight exceptional. Okay, but that's actually not all. Uh, so you can look for other curves in the plane, which, when you do the blow up, uh, become sections of this vibration. So the first thing to look for maybe be the lowest degree possible, which is lines. So I just take a, a, a random line and meet, meet each cubic in three points. So that'll be a trisection, not a section. But if you choose your line so that it uh, passes through two of the base points, then the blow up actually separates the line from the cubics at those points. So then it actually becomes a, a section. So in that way, uh, 
you can produce H U two more more sections of point zero, which are lines from P two through two of the base points. And by a similar calculation, you can do conics. There's H U five conics uh, through five base points. Um, but that's still not the entire story. So you can, you can keep going up in degree. But if you go uh, from conics to cubics, there's already a problem because cubic curves in the plane are no longer uh, p1. They're no longer genus zero. Uh, typically, they're going to be genus one. And any section of this vibration can better be genus zero. Um, but if you, if you choose your cubics to be singular, you're back to being in good shape. So you can, you can choose a, a nodal cubic where the node occurs at one of these base points. So in fact, when you blow up, it no longer has a singularity. It's actually a section. Um, so to set that up, to just just choose a cubic which passes through one of the base points twice, and it passes through uh, six others. So, so if you count those, you need to choose the node location, and then you need to choose which point to omit among the other base points. The total cubics when viewed in the plane. And when viewed in the blow up, they become sections. Okay, and so but we're still not done. So there's, there's a few more you can do. So you can go, this is cubics, you can go up to cortex. Uh, then you have three nodes now, the three nodes, nodal cortex. And uh, they need to pass through all the base points uh, and have nodes that also at base points. So if you think about how that is going to go, the count of those is H is three. All right, and then the next one up is cubics. Uh, which we have six nodes now, which be rational. The genus of plane curve is, is a triangular number. Um, so you, and you need to choose the location of those six nodes among the base points. So that's H U six. And then the last one is sectors. And there, if you if you work out the, the genus to make it correct, you're going to need it to have one triple point. So like asterisk at one of the base points, and then seven nodes. As well. And so the only choice there is, is the location of that triple point. Um, so that's H. Right, so you might be wondering why we're going through all this trouble. But if you add up the total to answer the question, you end up with 240. And this 240 number is the same as the number of roots in the EA class. Um, and that's actually not an accident. Uh, and, and furthermore, you can kind of see that there's a the symmetry to this list, so the eight matches with the eight at the bottom, and so on, and that corresponds to just to inverting a root in the lattice. And it also corresponds to just inverting the section with respect to the elliptic curve root block. Okay, so this is kind of the first step in the story. And it's a very classical theorem, I think maybe you just showed it or someone maybe earlier, that says that the um, the number of sections of a given height. Of height and of this vibration R P one is the coefficient of e to the one plus one in the theta function of the eight lattice, or also known as e four Eisenstein series. Uh, so this is a weight four. And so, so my goal is to kind of generalize this story um, in a couple different directions. So, so the first thing you can do is, is try to look at more complicated elliptic vibrations over P1. So, the, so this rational elliptic vibration that I just wrote down has odd bundle of one. Um, I just want to think of this just a measure of how twisted the, the vibration is. Um, Definition is just the, the bundle of polymorphic one forms on the fibers. Um, but it's, you can also construct uh, elliptic vibrations with any hot forms you want. So you can, you can construct all the SD, P1, the hot bundle. These are a bit different. So generically, they won't have any sections at all besides the zero section. Uh, so these 
No seconds. So the, the condition of having a section actually becomes a, a co-dimension d minus one condition. So having a section co-dimension minus one condition minus So so how do we set that up? Um, so one way to set that up is to Consider the, the moduli space of genus zero maps into some projective space of degree d. Uh, so this is uh, the moduli space of rational curve C with the map into projective space of degree d. And in order for this to be compact, I need to allow my rational curves to degenerate to trees of, of p1s, uh, so they're not all smooth. But once I do that, I get a nice uh, compact moduli space, a so smooth proper moduli stack. Okay, so this is a very well well studied object. And let me just fix now an elliptic vibration over the pr. So this is going to be elliptic vibration over pr. With, with Hodge bundle O1, the simplest possible Hodge bundle. And then now for each map from C into PR, I can just take the fiber product uh, S and X, and this S will be of the type uh, as before. So this, this one will have Hodge bundle O of D. I mean, I can state the conjecture. The conjecture is that for each D, there exists a, a cycle value modular form, actually a quasi modular form, so it's PD of Q. And quasi modular forms of the 6 to D minus 2. That's with the cohomology of this. In complex co dimension d minus one. Okay, so, so, what is this? It's, just a, it's a power series in Q where the coefficients, instead of being numbers, are, uh, are Chow classes or cohomology classes. Um, and so the coefficients correspond to the loci of surfaces. With, with a section of height n minus d. And so in, in the case when d equals one and r equals one, we're back in the situation of the, at the very beginning where, where we have the, uh, actually just a modular form of weight four, the d equals one, so this is four, and uh, chow zero is just c, so, so these, those do actually just have integer coefficients. Um, for higher d, you get this interesting cohomology value form. What do you mean by quasi-modular form? Sorry? What, what do you mean by quasi-modular form and what group is it invariant under in, in the Q? If yeah, you... So it, it, in the most standard sense, so it's the full group SL2Z. And so by quasi-modular form, I just mean uh, a polynomial in E2, E4, and E6. So, Quasi modular form algebra is the polynomial ring in the three Eisenstein series, e2, e4, e6, and e4, e6 are the modular ones. And if e2 is involved in your polynomial, then it's called quasi modular. Um, so I, I won't say sort of the analytic definition, but algebraically, this is a nice algebra because it has a differential structure. So there's a there's a differential operator D in terms of the Q expansion is Q D Q. 
Uh, so this is a, this raises the weight by two, and there's also a lower amount here called F, which is the partial derivative with respect to the the uh, quasi modular one P two times this factor of minus twelve. Uh, and so if you, if you think of D as a raising operator and F as a lowering operator, uh, you get an infinite dimensional representation of SL2, of the Lie algebra SL2. So this is, there's also H, which is just the diagonal operator with the closing weight. And so these three operators together give an SL2. Uh, and so I I won't write down the formula for how, how this action plays with with these quasi-modular forms with cycle coefficients. But roughly speaking, what happens is uh, taking the lowering operator breaks the curves apart into smaller degree pieces and taking the raising operator can reduce them together. Uh, so, so this is some kind of geometrization of the, of the SL2R action on, on quasi-modular forms. Uh, another thing I want to say is that you can kind of, once you have this statement for, for projective space, you can generalize it. So, so let B be a smooth projective variety. Let L be an ample line bundle. And let B be a class of, of the polynomial curves. And B. Uh, so then the conjecture is that there's, there's some B that now depends on this data. Quasi modular form, again, weight 6 d minus 2, this coefficient, and tau d minus 1, uh, where in this case d is the, is the intersection number of beta and um, And I should point out that uh, the choice of the elliptic vibration doesn't really matter uh, because they're all kind of connected. So as you vary the, the choice of your elliptic vibration over the base B, you're getting uh, cycles which are equivalent in cohomology. Uh, so this is really just, this is kind of a natural place for this invariant. Um, how much more time do I have? Good. Okay. Uh, okay, so maybe I'll stop there. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so what's known about this conjecture? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so I proved the conjecture for D equals 2. Uh, and I have some good evidence for it in higher degrees, meaning that I can basically for part of the cohomology of the moduli space, I can, I can check it. Uh, but the cohomology of, this, of the moduli space of table maps is, is a pretty well-studied object, and it's kind of complicated to give a formula in general for, the, for some representatives. So yeah, so that's sort of the status. Also, this should stabilize for, for large dimensions of, of the ambient projective space. So the, the cohomology ring of the conservative space stabilizes for large R, and so this, these uh, quasi modular forms should also do that. Um, and ultimately, this is probably going to relate to the gromov witten theory of, of the elliptic vibrations, and that's kind of where the motivation comes from. Thanks. Does this all take place over? Uh, for now, we'll receive, but uh, I see no obstruction to, yeah, to bringing it to the other fields. I mean, if it was happening over some smaller field, would this have some, would this be saying something about that number 240, that those 240 points were? Uh... Um, I see, well, I, I, so I mean, there's, you can think of sections as like points over the function for the P1. Is that I mean, so these are really kind of elliptic curves over some function of B, right? Um, so in that sense, yeah, these numbers are kind of counting. Yeah, maybe the correct statement is that it's a statement about counting points over function fields. Um, I don't know about finite fields or things like that. You have written four groups there. Is it really four groups or model here, or is it the same? Uh, yeah, so they're actually the same. Uh, well, sorry. So in the case of PR, they're the same. Um, in the case of a general base, these things are all algebraic, so I might as well take it in chow. Um, Except that it's 
it's not to be much bigger than cohomology, so, but it is in, independent of which translation you use. Uh, sorry, say again? Uh, cohomology should be a quotient of this show group, but um, you were, I did not really understand, but you were telling that some shows were irrelevant because it gives you could go continuously list from one to the other, but this does not mean that in modulo linear equivalence there will be no trick. Uh, yeah, so actually, yeah, so the statement is that the choice is rational and negative. Ah. So, so it actually makes sense to jump. Thanks. I, I have a question. Um, you explained that there's an action of SL2 on this quasi-modular ring. Um, most of your conjectures are described where you sort of fix a certain degree. Is there a way to glue a bunch of these uh, uh, moduli spaces together and get a big action of SL2 on a, on a module over this quasi-modular ring? Yeah, so roughly speaking, yes. Uh, at least let me just take the case of projective space where it's a, it's a smooth proper stack. There's kind of an inductive structure where the boundary of the moduli space is built out of lower degree uh, rational maps. So, so in that case, you can write phi d in terms of some products of, of phi lower d's um, and, and the raising lower operators. Um, so I think the proof of this conjecture is going to involve kind of induction and, and exploiting this, this SL2 action. Cool. Thank you. Like you said. So why, why SL2 at the end? That's the, could you imagine more generally having a lot more performance for reasons? Yeah, so I mean, my, my feeling is that SL2 is because we're looking at elliptic vibrations. You could probably do this for bands of abelian varieties. Generally, you get, you get other types of automorphic forms. But I haven't talked too much about that. Okay, so there seems to be no other questions. Thanks, and uh, we'll convene at 4 o'clock.